before I bring in Mark Farsetta here, I, I was watching him doing the halftime, and then I was watching him do the post game, and I saw the expressions on his face. And I, I really wondered, because me and Angelo yesterday were talking about it, 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 it's hard to believe you watched a coach lie all week. He just lied all week. And then to sit there and go, today, it's my offense, it's my call. So, okay, was that your call to send Sean Desai up there on a Tuesday and charade himself as D.C. and embarrass him all week long and tell every player on your team to lie all week long? What does that do to your locker room? When you've got a locker room that's lying all week to cover for your asses and you're not worried about Seattle, no wonder you lost. You're doing damage control. Now you got now you got Mr. Forget about it this weekend. You should beat him. <laughs> Speaking of forget about it. Let's go here. Let's go here. We got the seven, we got the seven fishes coming up on Sunday. <laughs> Mr. Forget about it, son. Mr. No, forget Sunday. about it's called <laughs> That's great. I love it. I haven't heard that one yet. Um, you did see that, uh, Mr. Forget About, Tom Cutlitz, Tommy Cutlitz himself yelled at the the uh, PR, not the PR guy, the social media director of the Giants. Did you see that? Oh, what do you do now? The guy that – the I've been in this guy's shoes, so I kind of feel bad for him. You know, every team's got their social media department. Well, they'll ask, like, hey, what are your favorite, you know, Thanksgiving foods? You know what I mean? Non-turkey, what's your favorite Thanksgiving – so that, the guy who does that for the Giants went up to Tommy DeVito and said, give me your top five <clears throat> Sopranos moments. And Tommy DeVito was like, I'm not doing this Italian stuff anymore. I just want to play football. Wah! And it's oh. like, dude, you literally said a week ago, it's good for business if your dad kisses your agent and your agent kisses your dad. So if you're going to get Sopranos questions, I mean, don't be surprised and don't be pissed off. You know what I'm saying? I would be cutting my hair like John Gotti if I were him. <laughs> I mean, are you high? You need to play the role because, listen, dude, you've extended your 15 minutes of fame into 30. You need to do everything you can. I'm glad he went back. I said this to him five months ago, three months ago, Mark. This guy would have did a live appearance for five pies. Yeah. Now he's talking about doing it for his agent. And the guy, by the way, I, I swear to God, this guy's a guy, his agent looks like a guy that belongs over at Bensonhurst getting an espresso or a cappuccino for one of the dudes down there with the funny noses. Hey, it's all good at the hunting club. You know, it's okay. I get it. But holy cow, we're lighting the fireworks off down there at uh, Bergen. We got it. I got it. All right. I go, but guy, man, know your role here. Yes. Have fun with it. And I got to say this just real quick. I Speaking of being in the, the, the PR person's shoes or the, the social media person's shoes, I once brought the game of Crossfire. Remember that game, that like board game? I brought that into the Eagles locker room. For two guys to play because we had been talking about it and we were going to film it. We we're going to do this hit for NBC Sports Philly and whatever. And um, the um, I would you would be shocked. Well, maybe you wouldn't be shocked because obviously you've been in NFL locker rooms. The excitement on the 2017 2018 Eagles faces when I brought Crossfire into the they started like really going at it, spraying little you know metal balls all over the place. The PR team came over to me and were like, "Look, this is a place of business. You can't be doing this." And Jordan Mylata was as happy as a kid on Christmas to see that thing. I don't know if that was huge in Australia or New Zealand or whatever the hell, but man, I got, I literally, I don't say, I wouldn't say I got yelled at, but I got reprimanded because this is a place of business. We can't continue to play games like this. Now all they do is play games, unfortunately. Let me tell you this, man. So I'm down in, um, I'm, I'm in Tampa and, oh God, they had, um, it was, um, it, oh, it was Derek Brooks and it was uh, Warren Sapp and they, it was Madden. Oh. Matt and uh, Warren Sapp comes up to me, and I go, what's the matter? He goes, just son of a – I go, what's the matter? He goes, 88 rating? Are you crazy? 88 rating? I'm at least a 91. I'm like, Warren, I mean, what are you talking about? He goes, they rated me 88-1. I'm yeah. like, the Madden people did? He goes, dude, are you kidding me? 88-1 puts me in a pile with a bunch of nobodies. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going like, God, these guys got really bent over over this stuff, man. Mm. I mean, you you'd be, I think they'd be shocked how many great gamers there are in NFL locker rooms. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I, oh, I, oh, absolutely. I mean, NFL, NBA, 
Yes. Uh, there was there was a story with the Phillies a couple of years ago where Carlos Santana went and put a baseball bat through a TV and a PlayStation because guys were playing it in the in the clubhouse. Uh, it, and you know what's really funny? Every football player I have ever spoken to always remembers always remembers their lowest Madden rating ever. And they'll, usually what they say is, "Man, I don't pay attention to that. I don't pay attention to that." And I'll be like, "Oh yeah," and they'll be like, I'll be like "What's your lowest rating?" And they're like, "I don't care." Seventy two. Like they just every <laughs> single time, every single time. <laughs> All right, Mark. Here, I'm not. I'm not going to pollute the question, and I'm not going to lead your honor, and I'm not going to lead the witness here to right. anything here. I've watched your face. I, I thought I saw you with a kind of a pretty stunned on what you saw with Seattle. And I think you had organization questions. I think you had all kinds of stuff. Give me your – get this. I don't even want to talk about Seattle. I want to ask you what you thought about the last 10 days leading up to today on what you thought with this organization. Because I think that was the explana explanation point, that Seattle game, on what this whole week was. Mm -hmm. No, I, I absolutely, and and you must realize that I'm a horrible poker player because I have oh, no, no poker you, face. I, I watched your face; it was like you were in disbelief. <laughs> I did. The, you're ten and one a couple of weeks ago. All right, you're ten and one for the second consecutive season. Like, wh how many teams have ever done that in the history of the NFL? Like, next oh, to nobody, right? Very. So rare. then, yeah, very. Rare. So then, you decide to fire your defensive coordinator, who just went up against. One of the best offenses, one of the best defenses in San Francisco, and then one of the best defenses and best offenses again in the uh, Dallas Cowboys. Um, they your, shut down the Dolphins. They shut down the Dolphins. Uh, that was probably their most – that probably right there was their best win of the season because yes. that was one of the games that they actually controlled more or less from start to finish. If I remember correctly, they had a little sputter in the middle, and then they put the nail in the coffin. But watching all that and then watching the two – watching 10-1, and one, then the last two weeks – and your defense was, by the way, the only team to put the ball in the end zone against the Dallas Cowboys. And you decide after that, this Sean Desai guy's a problem. This Sean Desai guy, he, he's the real problem here. Not, not the offense not being able to gain any, any type of consistency. What the problem is, is Sean Desai. With four games left in the season, with the opponents being Seattle, and you still knew at the time you made the decision that Drew Locke was going to be the starting quarterback, turning out it didn't matter. And then you got, uh, you know, Mr. Forget About It twice on the schedule and and Jonathan Gannon's Arizona Cardinals. And you mean to tell me that you couldn't have had any bit of a, I don't know, rallying cry or improvement in the last four games of the season? You had to make the change right then and there. That, look, regardless of Matt Patricia being far more experienced and, we, yes, will most likely do a better job, we knew that going into the season that he was most likely going to do a better job if he was hired as your defense coordinator than Sean Desai. And you make this decision now, it shows one thing and it sends a horrible message. The message and what it shows is panic and quicksand. And we don't know what the hell we're doing. And you make that guy trot out in front of the media last Wednesday to answer questions and only for it to come out Sunday that he's no longer calling defensive plays. That is grasping at straws. That is a flare gun in the air. That is a you know smoke signal that you need all the help you can possibly get. And it shows, above all else, desperation in this franchise with zero sense of urgency. And that is a stink that's going to be hard to kick. I'm going to put you on the spot here, man, because I want to see what side of the aisle you're on here. Um, do you really believe that Nick Sirianni made that firing call? No. I, I, no, this is one of those thank things. God, thank no. you. <laughs> why, okay. pe why do people in your business in your city, why do they think that that guy actually made that call? Um, because it's an, no, e that's it, not the case. It's an, what it is. It's an easier, you want to believe that your head coach is in charge. I think every team, every fan base, wants to believe that their head coach, and even if you're in Philadelphia and you know Howie Roseman is in charge with a lot of orders from Jeffrey Lurie and his analytical department and all that stuff, analytics department, kid. right, all that, if you want to tell me that most fan bases don't want to at least believe that their head coach is in charge, I, I think that that's a, a, an absolute lie. But in Philadelphia, Howie Roseman and a lot of Jeffrey Lurie they are in charge of what happens with the Philadelphia Eagles. And one of the reasons Nick Sirianni got his job, and I'm a Nick Sirianni fan. I think he's done a great job over the last two years. What's happened most recently, There's it's inexcusable. Your offense obviously needs a swift kick in the old behind, but Brian Johnson has what I call the Hurts protection plan. 
for me, Howie Roseman and Jeffrey Lurie are the ones calling the shots, and a lot of it's on Howie Roseman. The day-to-day -day is Howie Roseman. The big decisions are Jeffrey Lurie. And Nick Sirianni is a guy that didn't have a lot of experience, was an offensive coordinator under an offensive head coach in Indianapolis, and prior to that, not a whole lot of experience. And you hired him here because he's a positive guy. He's got the emotional intelligence. His heart is very much opened, and he does the most important thing, which is no, not win, not get to a Super Bowl, but allow Jeffrey Lurie to feel like he is the owner and final say of what goes on in this football team. That's why Nick Sirianni has this job. You agree that that organization is capable of any decision now that could possibly be made when it comes to firing Doug Peterson, Andy Reid, mm -hmm. firing Desai, demoting him, whatever you want, um, getting rid of Wentz, doing all this. They're capable of anything because they love control. Let me ask you this. I, I've been funny. I've been going along the websites like IP and Fanatic, and I've been looking at some of the stuff on the Inquirer. I'm starting to see, are we in Wentz mode? And I was like this, and I thought to myself, huh, interesting. Let me, let me, let me, that this contract that this kid has, and I'm going to give you one last shot because I'm sure you were on the side of Wentz too back in the day when he finished runner up in the MVP. And it's not a bad, I'm not, I'm not putting you on a spot here with that, Mark. But what I am saying is he started, I believe, 38 games, maybe 48 games that he's now started. Are you confident that this organization is going to continue to develop him like they didn't Wentz? I mean, uh, are you are you confident that they're going to put qualified people around him that to develop him? Because you know, not that Wentz Wentz destroyed himself too. Yeah. I mean, it's going to be a slower burn with with Hurts because of his mental toughness. But if they don't put quality people around him, you're seeing the regression this year by not having. It's not Hurts, Mark. It's the people around him. You keep good guys ask the same question every day. Same offense, same personnel. What's wrong? Well, it's incompetence around him. Are you uh, are you sure they're going to continue his development? Because this year they haven't. Yeah. Um, I'll put it to you like this. Even if they mess up by not putting good people around him, even if they don't coach him properly, for instance, if they're the ones telling him to throw that deep ball to Quez Watkins, you know, and absolutely and, they are. And, okay. And if they're the ones telling him to go to AJ Brown on that route to end the game where the final interception happened, which again, no I, then I think eventually you're going to get to a point where Jalen Hurts is going to say, to hell with y'all. I'm doing what I want to do when I'm out there on the football field. And if okay, they Doug. win, and, yeah, right. And Doug was a Doug was very similar in that regard, in terms of, guys, I, you just want a Super Bowl with me as the head coach of a, of, a, of a very deep football team, of a team that was down to their third stringers in some aspects. You know, I th think I should have some say over buying the groceries, not just cooking dinner, so to speak, to use Bill Parcells' line. Yeah. But I don't think Jalen Hurts is going to allow them to corrupt Jalen Hurts. I think Jalen Hurts is a strong enough, uh, in the mental aspect I of the game, to say, Okay, you guys don't want to do this? Then trade me, all right? Just like he left Alabama and went to Oklahoma, trade me. Let me move on. Let me go somewhere else. But if there's a route underneath that I can take to help get a first down or extend a drive, then I'm going to do it. On a first and 10 with 8.15 left in the fourth quarter and us leading 17 to 14, I'm not going to take that shot down to Quez Watkins. I'm going to find somebody who is underneath. I'm going to scramble for a couple of yards. I'm going to slide. I'm going to get out of bounds, whatever the case may be. Because the case in point at that, time in the game is to make sure you maintain control of the game. If they continue to coach him differently, I think he will rise above it and eventually move on in his career elsewhere. But I don't look at, I don't at all look at Jalen hurts and say, Oh, this is just like Carson Wentz because they are two totally different athletes. And one of the things I love most about Jalen hurts is the fact that this guy between the ears is one of the most mentally tough athletes I've ever seen with all the stuff going on with Deshaun Watson and Russell Wilson and you know Aaron Rodgers coming available two years ago and all that stuff. Oh, you make that trade? Do you make this deal? Do you sign him? Do you trade? Whatever. Jalen Hurts just said through the whole process, I'm above it all. And it wasn't in an arrogant way. It isn't I'm better than this. It was I'm focusing on what I can control. And he controlled it to the point of making it to the playoffs for the first as a first-time starting quarterback in the NFL. And in the second year, 
MVP runner up, Super Bowl appearance. And then this year, three weeks ago, Sills, he's the guy's the leading favorite to be the MVP again. So I think Jalen Hurts is a guy that will continue to rise above it if this is the way it continues in his career. Don't get me wrong, though. He played like straight up garbage against Seattle. So let's not mince words. But as far as the overall career, I think he'll be fine. Is Nick Sirianni the answer in Philadelphia? Have you paused on that at all, Mark, where it's made you go like this? I mean, you see, we all got we all kind of got blinded by the 10 and 1 record. But I also think you can get blinded by the one loss record here with what you're seeing on how the operation, especially in adverse times, you know, when things are going great, you're a front runner, everything's awesome. But when you see a little adversity, sometimes your true colors get exposed. And I think that's kind of a little bit here, what we're seeing a couple of the flaws here with the guy. Are you as steadfast that this guy's the right guy for this job? I think there, there comes a point where you have to trust your own football instinct. And I'd like to think that, you know, even the guy, even though the guy didn't play in the NFL, uh, the guy has a good football instinct and he has been a good leader with the leaders Mark that are in that locker good room. Does he have football instincts or does he have good organizational instincts? Well, I think when you can, when you're not a player and you could tap in to this locker room, the way he's been able to tap into this locker room over the last two years, I give him a lot of credit for that because he's gotten the respect of these players like Doug Peterson did almost instantaneously. You and Doug Peterson was obviously a player. For the players after the way he lied last week, all week long, and then made a coach go out there and embarrass them. Yeah, because I don't think he was lying to the players. I think the players knew knew the deal. Okay, I think that's right. You 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 don't. He probably got the call Wednesday and said, "Hey, the bat phone's ringing." Hey, guess what? They want to see you. Up. Okay, no, I, I I agree with that. Yeah. I don't think he knew till Wednesday night because in the next day, remember they had that padded practice and yep. Hurts is doing up downs. I'm like, what is that? <laughs> and all of a sudden, we knew we knew there was a theatrical play going on, which Jeffrey Lurie's known to do. And yeah. So we 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 kind of saw it. So I'm, okay, I got it. You're right. You're right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That that's the way I that's the way I see I, that I'm playing. With you. Out. Okay. So that's the way I see that playing out. But the thing is with Sirianni, eventually. You have to say, guys, and he said this today in his press conference, which where, where by the way, he was a little, uh, I'll call him snippy Sirianni. He wasn't too happy with some of the questions he was getting, and some of his answers were a little snippy. But at some point, you got to say, guys, I was hired for a reason. Let me let me do the job that you hired me to do. Now, eventually, that becomes a push comes to shove moment where it's like, okay, you want to do the, you do the coach? Yeah, exactly, exactly. But the only difference here is that you got three games left in the season. And all of a sudden, if Nick Sirianni ends up turning this thing around and has a little bit of a different play design, a um, little bit of a different philosophy, and they have success doing that, well, then that guy can puff his chest out. And you want to say that this guy's got a couple of playoff wins under his belt and he wants more control, similar to Doug. Now, Doug had a Super Bowl victory under his belt already and on his resume, so he was much more set up than that. But if Nick Sirianni could do it again, he's going to have another head coaching job in his back pocket any second. So I think the last three games of this season and the way it looks in the playoffs and how Nick Sirianni, Nick Sirianni tries to turn the tides of this is really going to be telling for the very near future of the Philadelphia Eagles. Okay. I have a conspiracy theory. Love it. Go ahead. I what do you got? Want, I, 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 I want to just tell me if you land on any of this here. So you put an experienced, whatever you think of Patricia, the guy's got a couple Super Bowl rings and he's been with Belichick. So, I mean, you would assume it. By the way, I think he's kind of put in there also because he is known for this press cover and design cover. He, he he's a guy that does disguise coverages, which has always been something that they've done up in New England. Okay, follow me here. If this thing goes a little bumpier offensively in the play calling, does Nick take over and then hire Frank as a consultant, and then they go into the playoffs with Frank Reich? Who Jalen Hurts loves because of Philip Rivers. Do they go in to the playoffs with Nick, Frank, and Patricia as the play callers? Could you uh, potentially see that? Absolutely. And it's 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 funny you say that because I had this very similar parallel uh conspiracy theory to yours. Sean Desai, Jonathan Gannon. Okay, Sean Desai, Jonathan Gannon. What do those two guys have in common? Not a lot of experience before being a defensive coordinator of the Philadelphia Eagles. So Nick Sirianni might have felt like he had to oversee, be a little bit more involved, a little bit involved with the defense under two very inexperienced defensive coordinators. 
Also, Shane Steichen turns out to be a pretty damn good offensive mind. So if you're saying that Shane Steichen's a better offensive mind or play caller than Nick Sirianni, that's not exactly the biggest slap in the face no. to Nick Sirianni, okay? So he doesn't feel now with Matt Patricia as the defensive coordinator that he's got to hover over that and have any responsibility for that. That's all on Matt's plate. So now that gives him more time to focus on the offense. He's got the most trustworthy defensive coordinator he's ever had while being here in Philadelphia, and he's got an offensive play caller that has obviously been struggling. The red carpet is rolled out for Nick Sirianni to take over the play calling right now. He has never been a better position as the head coach of the Eagles, as an offensive-minded head coach, to take over play calling responsibilities. And yes, if you want to roll out that red carpet for Frank Reich, you rolled out the red carpet for Vic Fangio last year as a consultant. Where's that same red carpet for Frank Reich? Because it should be there because this offense needs a kick in the ass. And I think Frank Reich would be the perfect guy to come in here and say, Jalen, let's party, man. We know what we could do here. I know what you're capable of. Let's play to your strengths and let's go at it for the rest of this season and into the playoffs. Here's why I went here. And I've told you the story Frank's been on numerous times, and he said the story that um, Jeffrey Lurie called him with a reference on Sirianni, and this was all during the whole Carson Wentz trade to Indianapolis um, with Chris Ballard, and all those guys were on the phone, then how he got on the phone and all this and that. And I'm thinking, okay, so the Jeffrey Lurie loves Frank. Now, I looked at it this way, and I went, you know, when they hired Sean Desai this past summer, they never bought into him because two weeks later they hired a babysitter and Matt Patricia. So, I mean, think about it, Mark. They never bought into him from day one. They, they, they hired a babysitter. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's not how you traditionally do it because how many times you and I were going, what's his job? I mean, he's a special assistant to the guy who's the guy and he's yeah. the head coach. Right. He does, does he get coffee? What is he? Who's, who's he answering to? No, no, he's my guy. Oh, okay. What's his title? You don't have one. What? <laughs> I mean, we're going like, what? Where, what's his gig? Senior advisor to the regional something manager like, or something? Yeah. 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 Senior advisor to the head coach and the goomba. I don't know. I was like, okay. So this is why I'm going here with this, that. You're right. They brought Fangio in. I think Fangio was in the building, though, from the beginning of the summer last year when he was in the building. But Frank knows the building. Frank worked in the building. He knows. And by the way, what makes it even more of a plug-in, he knows how the analytics department runs, and he knows how the entire operation runs. So it wouldn't be an awkward hire. And, and, and Jalen... He said it a million times. The guy I watch all the time is Philip Rivers film. He talks once a month with him on reading defenses. And guess who his offensive coordinator was? Frank Reich. And who was the wide receiver coach in San Diego? It was Nick Sirianni. So, I mean, it just seems it's trending that way. Yeah, and I, like I said, I would roll out that red carpet in a heartbeat because I know you talk about the Eagles and – uh, up until three weeks ago, they were averaging, I think it was one-tenth of a point more than what they were scoring under Shane Steichen a year ago. You were talking about one of the best offenses in the NFL. But this is what I always say. I don't know if I've told you this before, but one of the things I live by is, man, yeah, numbers never lie, but they sure as hell can deceive. And you can't tell me that you watch this Eagles offense and you, you saw the same fluidity, you saw the same explosiveness that you saw in maybe the last two seasons, especially last season. Because I haven't seen that at all. And now you have better weapons when Dallas Goddard's healthy. You obviously have A.J. Brown, Devontae Smith, DeAndre Swift, who should be an explosion out of the backfield, whether running or uh, or catching a pass. And they rarely ever use that. And here's what was so annoying to me. It, it was, you know, it we're was all having career years, too. Right. Well, okay. It, all case in point. Case in point. Then why aren't you winning these games? Why aren't you even putting up a, a fight in these games? You just went up against – one of the worst defenses in all the land in the Seattle Seahawks. And you mean to tell me you could have put up more than 17 points? Marcus Mariota might have been able to put up more than 17 points. And that ain't a brag. That's Mark, just how bad the Seattle Drew Seahawks Lock are. Beat you. What's that? Drew Locke beat you. Drew Locke. <laughs> yes. Dude, let that settle. Drew, we're not talking Drew Bledsoe. Oh, it ain't Drew settling. Drew Locke beat you, and he went 92 on you at the <laughs> end of the game. Sills, Sills, it's been a couple days already. It ain't <laughs> close to settling. You need to bring out the Brioski or something because I ain't feeling it, okay? <laughs> it hasn't settled even a little bit. 
So I, hey, I haven't even asked you this. Do they win Sunday? <laughs> yeah, I do. I think they win. I hate myself for feeling that way, but I feel like they do win. I there's look at you. Look at everyone. He's so dejected. They I am. I'm, just, know, I'm disgusted with myself. I, and no, no, they win. All right. <laughs> <laughs> but but here's the, it's it's but here's the thing. And, and I always tell people this is what I said even when they were ten and one. When you're criticizing a team that has a, a great record, and let's face it, ten and one is a pretty damn good record. It's not about it's not about beating, uh, you know, the Giants, for instance, this coming week. It wasn't about beating the Buccaneers. It wasn't about beating the Vikings. It wasn't about beating the Patriots. It's about whether or not you could play like that against a superior team and still expect to win. Because if the bar to get to is winning the Super Bowl, are they playing like a Super Bowl caliber team? And maybe the one game that we referenced earlier, the Miami Dolphins game, was the only game we could really look at and say, that's how a Super Bowl caliber team plays. Other than that, not so much. You look at the way they played against the Chiefs. The, they make a, the Chiefs make a couple of plays. The Eagles get called for a holding call on their first touchdown. I mean, it's a whole different game. Now, the ball bounces the other way as well. Maybe if the Eagles get two touchdowns right out of the gate instead of two field goals against the 49ers, maybe it's a little bit of a different game as that game goes on. I doubt it because 49ers just turned it into high gear. But when you watch a team play the way they've been playing and you don't see the consistency within the offense, I understand everyone's going to have a three and out here and there. But when you don't see the consistency in the offense with those explosive plays, when you do decide to commit to them, that's where you start to have a lot of worry. Now, here's where here's here's one of my biggest problems with that loss to Seattle. Well, the game in general, I should say. Sills, they teased us. <laughs> they actually ran motion. They had motion in the Early. backfield. The first series of the game, what was it, a 15 play drive, 75 yeah. yards, about 8:30 on the clock. Yep. You saw Jack Stahl go in motion. You yep. saw him run a different kind, a different uh, kind of tight end screen with Dallas Goddard, where you saw him do that little slip behind the blockers and then cut it upfield. You never saw it. I went, well, look, you got, I say, hot damn, we got some creativity here. You saw them commit to the run. They ran it ten times on that, and those SOBs teased the hell out of the Philadelphia fan base with how well they called that opening drive how well they executed that opening drive, and how well they came up on third downs on that opening drive. I think they converted three of them on that first drive, and then they capped it off with Jalen Hurts running to the outside for the touchdown. And I thought, okay, you know what? Nick Sirianni said last week, he hears the outside noise, and he listens to it. And I saw some motion. He hears the outside noise. You had a guy sitting out front in crappy gym shorts with a sign that said, fire Sean Desai. And what did they end up doing? They fire Sean Desai. So they sometimes listen to it, and they need to listen to it. And the motion in the backfield, the committing to the run, they listened to it, and they teased us because they got the hell away from it for the vast majority of that game after that first drive. I got two last questions for you here. One of them is this. Do you believe Jalen Hurts can find the open guy, or do you believe Jalen Hurts has to be told where to throw the ball? <sighs> I, you know, Mark, it, too many open guys. If you watch the 22, absolutely. there's just absolutely. way too many open guys. Mm -hmm. the, 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 the most famous one right now is the is uh, Kenny Gainwell on the delayed route on the last play of the game that ended up being the interception there to A.J. Brown. I don't know even if Kenny – Even Devontae underneath. Devontae before that. that. Yeah, that was another one. A.J. Brown even commented on that on social media saying, like, oh, this works, it's great, but, you know, it didn't work, so everyone's pissed. No, I, how about this? How about when you're winning a game, when you're leading a game, and this is the other thing, against the Seattle Seahawks, not the 49ers or the Cowboys that can explode with offense at any given moment, because nine times out of ten, I don't expect Seattle to explode the way they did in that 92 drive, but you don't need that kill shot. You could just play an easy, controlled game. You don't have to put the pigskin in peril like they did on those two plays. Take the underneath route. I'm going to answer your question by saying this. The, uh, to answer your question, Jalen Hurts is missing guys that are underneath, and I think he's coached to miss the guys underneath because he's coached to go for the splash play. And what the Eagles are so hypocritical about, or maybe just don't realize, is that they say they, they, they go for two things, turnovers and splash plays. Well, if you're forcing the splash play, you know what's probably going to happen? A turnover. Yeah. So what the hell are they doing? How are they coaching him up? It, it's happened far too often. I think they were last year. I think they were the, the team with the fewest targets to running backs. And then this year, they're around that same type of category with adding DeAndre Swift. So for me, that has to be a coaching point to Jalen Hurts that he has to overcome 
because he's got to be smart enough. I mean, you talk about final say all the time, final say over the roster, final say over the play caller. As the quarterback with the ball in your hands, they're not going to bench you after they made you the franchise quarterback. You have the final say over where that ball goes. And if you have a route underneath, you have to understand game management. He's not an idiot. He understands game management. He should take those opportunities underneath to make sure they're bleeding the clock, having long drives, and give no opportunity for that team to come back. Here, here the philosophy is so fundamentally flawed. Think mm -hmm. about the play where Devontae's open underneath. So you're telling me you'd rather go to the harder throw on the sideline where you've got a shorter window when you've got the entire left side of the field wide open instead of going to that, you're going to make the harder throw on yourself. And if you look at the numbers now, Mark, Brown leads the NFL in the most targets. 32% of the targets that Jalen Hurts has thrown this year has gone to him. He leads the league. I mean, why, 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 if you're the play caller or if this is Nick's offense, why are you forcing the quarterback to make the harder throw when you have the easier Tom Brady won seven Super Bowls doing that. Okay, that that Devontae underneath play, Brady check downs and that play right there, spread them out deep, run them underneath. I mean, why are they making it more complicated than it has to be? Because you know why they're telling this kid where to go. Let the kid. I want Jalen Hurts 2022, Mark. Yeah. I would I'd like to see that guy as well. And you know what I saw? You know what I saw last year from that guy? This. I saw progressions. This year, I'm just seeing this. And then I'm seeing right there. That's what he I'm saying. He was a weapon last year. He was a weapon. Now what you've done is you've neutered him. You you <laughs> you basically have neutered the guy. They're running so fewer RPOs now. By the way, when he when he takes off, he's frightening. He, he is utterly frightening when he takes off. When you take that component away from him, he's just another dude out there. Mm -hmm. and, and I'll say this about the second half of the season. A better runner than he did in the first half of the season. He looks, I mean, first off, he looks healthy. Um, and he looks like he's running with conviction and confidence and he's securing the football when he does it, with the exception, of course, against the Cowboys. But at least just in terms of him running, he looks like a far better, far healthier runner than what we saw in the first half of the year. Uh, it's, it, I mean, talk about neutering. I mean, the Eagles, <laughs> they've neutered Jalen Hurts and now they've also neutered uh, Sean Desai. So I don't know what their plan is by the end of the year. Um, it's just funny that the Eagles are playing like they have no balls right now. And oh, they absolutely oh, oh. need that. Hey, wait a minute, wait a minute. If this is not dysfunction on the way out the door, so let me get this right. Sean Desai is still the D coordinator, but he's not the play caller. But Matt Patricia is now the play caller, but he's not designated as the D coordinator. Desai's still in the building getting coffee for everyone, and <laughs> Patricia's on the sideline making calls with the pencil in his ear. Is that right? That's uh, you got it. You got it. You got it down pretty good there, my friend. You got it down pretty good. <laughs> Okay, yeah, you, you nailed seven it. Seven fishes on Sunday. What's that? What's the seven fishes on Sunday? Okay. All right. I actually made. I just made the menu and I sent it to my pops because, as I've told you before, it's the first time I'm hosting in in my new place. So, all right, uh, we're gonna go with chopino, clams, mussels, little cod spread yep. about. Gonna be oh, fantastic. Yeah. Little shrimp, little scallops, little yep. calamari. Yep. Uh, I'm gonna do a calamari and gravy or a godlamad in gravy. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to make that in the, in the marinara marinara. And then, uh, oh, you like it in the marinara sauce. That's so, oh, I love that. I <laughs> fried, fried calamari. It's neat. That's white guys eat that. Uh, Italian guys don't eat fried calamari. We eat galamad in marinara sauce. Galamad. Yeah. Yeah. You let, leave the rest of the metagons. And, yeah, uh, nobody's anyway. doing here, man. <laughs> fried I make calamaris. A, I make a, I make a tuna crostini. Wow. Ooh, Fantastic. Nice. Oh yeah. 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 I'm going to do, um, Tilapia, fried tilapia sliders for the kids. Okay. Uh, those are good. And uh, as a entree, with my wife's idea, I got to give her credit. Um, uh, cod piccata over fresh made linguine. Oh, Boom. Angel hair? I, I'm gonna make a no, I'm gonna make a linguine. Uh, oh, okay. I, I got a I got a I made a pasta board a couple of years ago. Nice. A two, a two foot by four foot maple pasta board. I get it, yes, sir. Oh. 
and uh, I can't you got wait. It all I flowered up already. All flowered up. <laughs> I gotta, yes, I gotta yes. clean it since I moved. It's been in the garage, so I gotta clean it first. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then I gotta put yeah. down the, the the what's it called butcher block uh, yeah. wax, and yeah, then yeah, gotta, yeah then, and then the 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 roller and the whole thing. Yeah, yeah. So we're gonna have bacala. We always you mentioned bacala. that before. Do you buy the 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 cardboard salted bacala and then soak that, or do you buy like the good? Oh, I like buy the good, but yeah, okay. I don't, okay. ain't no nothing in a box coming in a big sales house. That we ain't, hey, we don't we don't eat box fish. Now that ain't okay. working All right. for me. All right. All right. I'm a massive scungeel guy. Okay? okay, so I love scungeel, and I'm gonna have the galamad marinara like you'd like it. Um, I'm also gonna have stuffed artichokes. But that's on the side with my lobster stuffed. I'm going to have steamers. We have a really great way also of making the casino. Um, oh, we're cool. also going to have like little, little um, galamad like uh, steaks also over a sauce. They're like little tiny steaks. You can get them like that too. They're like that little big. Oh my um, God. We'll have mussels and I'll have it and I'll have an angel hair with our tremendous sauce. And I'll have all of this around us. And my God Almighty, I, I, I my mouth is watering now, man. Because I mean, I love that thing. Is, yeah. is that not like your favorite eat? You know, I love Thanksgiving. Oh yeah, but dude, that Friday night, my entire life. And, and by the way, we'll probably make some gaba deals, and okay. we'll build yeah. that stuff too. We'll make some gaba deals and such like that. You know what we used oh. to do when I was younger with my grandma. So my grandma didn't have a big cutting board back in the day. So we would get like a a, 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 a bed sheet. This is where my grandmother slept. And so we would put the blood sheet on. We'd get the powder. We'd make the gabadils out of the churner, right? We'd make them homemade gabadils. We would roll them on the bed. And we would dry them in the, in the oh, my God. It was, this thing is, <laughs> you got to remember something. My folks didn't speak English until they spoke 50% English. And they spoke like um, uh, American Sicilian dialect. Okay. Yeah, but they're yeah they're it's they 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 were this is like a real big. I grew up in a oh really big God. time Guinea house. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I really did, man. I mean, my folks didn't. Anytime they didn't want me to know what was going on, you know, they thought I didn't know. I started picking it up. They go, okay, this guy's picking up Italian now. <laughs> so yeah, no, man, I have a really good. That's that's great. How many people coming over? Uh, I literally just got off the phone with my cousin Ray about an hour ago. Um, my father's cousin Ray, and he's like an OG man. He he has been coming over to Seven Fish forever. He would bring my aunt Ange, who was like my my grandmother, God rest her soul. And um, it's gonna total out, I think, to be twenty one people. Woo! Yeah, small family oh, gathering, you know. <laughs> hey, but you know what you know you know what you do when you tell the twenty one people? Tell your wife to do this. Hey, bring a plate. Yeah. Bring a plate. You you know somebody bring like you know. Bring some ziti or something. I don't care what you bring. My mom's bringing shrimp. My mom loves the shrimp cocktail, so she's gonna bring the shrimp. My father's making. Uh, we, we call it zeppoli, but yeah, you know, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, that's great. Yeah, he's gonna do that. My brother. My mom's from Baltimore, so like crabs are a huge oh, yeah. thing in oh, my family. God. So my brother's bringing the crabs, not not like old bay style, but like you know, big steam, yeah, yeah, yeah. Alaskan king crab type deals. Oh. Um, so that's going to be an appetizer. My mother-in-law who's coming, she's only come one time before she's half Sicilian. you never know it, but, uh, <laughs> she's, uh, she's got a shellfish allergy. Oh. So we're going to be, we're going to be, all right, Mary, don't eat anything on this table. This is this you Mary safe zone table. over here. <laughs> yeah, right. yeah. You go sit at the kitty table. Yeah, we got, they got cheese pizza over here. Hey, let me just say this to you, man. Mark, I would. If somebody, if, if the doctor came to me, uh, Dan, you can't um, eat shellfish. I'd be like, I'll tell you what. I, when you find me, I'll be dead with lobsters all over me, <laughs> and I will have scongeal everywhere near me. What did he die of? He died of an overdose of lobster. Thank you, <laughs> Mark. Whatever, you so whatever's in an epipen, whatever's in an epipen, just put it in an IV, and yeah. I'll just eat my meal that way. Right, right. You know what? Just put the marinara sauce in me and knock me out now. I'm there out. you go. I'm out. Thank you, brother. I appreciate it. You were awesome, dude. Talk to you in a couple minutes. Yeah, talk to you in a couple minutes. You're going to be on my show. I appreciate that. Always good hanging out, my friend. Absolutely, my friend. Thank you so much, Mark Farsetta. Yeah, we're going to be on with Mark a little bit later on, too. So do me a favor. Please hit the like button. Keep it here on the National Football Show. Eat chicken wings, buy Hooters things. Christmas is near. Shop, have a beer. Christmas shopping shouldn't be hard. Give your friends a Hooters gift card. 
This year, stuff their stockings and yours too with a one size fits all gift card. Buy a $25 Hooters gift card and receive a $5 Santa's bonus card. Make it Hooters for the holidays. Eat chicken wings, buy Hooters things. Christmas is near. Gift cards are here. Good at Hooters everywhere now. Hooters gifts are always favored.